welcome to the Electric Valley. How do we continue building momentum in Arizona's EV manufacturing sector? And our topic is the electric vehicle companies and suppliers in the greater Phoenix metropolitan area and across Arizona, now being referred to as the Electric Valley. We got a lot to talk about. We got some great people to do it with. And as we get started, I would love to turn this over to the CEO of Arizona Forward, Ms. Lori Singleton. Lori? Good morning. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Lori Singleton, and um, Arizona Forward is pleased to co-host this session today, and you'll be hearing from Ann here in a second. I think you're probably all familiar with who Arizona Forward is, but if you're not, we're a 53-year-old nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that's focused on um, environmental and sustainability issues with a, a, a keen focus this year on climate action. And we all recognize that electric vehicles are uh, one of our, uh, an important solution as we think about climate. So we're pleased to bring this session to you today. I just want to take one second to make an announcement about our upcoming environmental awards program on March 19th at the Arizona Biltmore. Um, if you haven't been, it's a black tie event, and we really showcase all of the great work that's going on throughout the state. So please um, join us if you are available and um, would like to, to be part of a great evening. Um, information is on our website about that event. And I think I'll turn it over to Ann. I'm Ann Feldhusen, and I'm with Chambers for Innovation and Clean Energy. And we are a national nonprofit providing information to local chambers all around the U.S. on the clean energy economy, and in particular on the economic and financial opportunities with the clean energy economy. So I'm very happy to be here today and co-hosting with Lori and Arizona Forward this session. And thank you to John, our moderator, and all our wonderful panelists we have here. Um, we're excited to talk about the growing clean energy economy, specifically in Arizona, and really dive into the whole sector of EV manufacturing. So thank you again for everyone for joining the session today. And I will turn it back over to John. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Lori. Again, I am John Ford. I'm the immediate past chair of Arizona Forward and so glad to be here today for this discussion. Uh, I got to say, Anne and Lori are the ones who put this party on. They did all the work. They did so much to get it together. Thank you to both of you. I know we're going to have a great discussion today because, folks, I don't know if you know about this, but electric vehicles are a thing. Uh, and the competition is getting pretty darn intense for where the manufacturing centers are going to be for that work, for that industry. And the good news is that Arizona is off to a rip roaring start. So we're going to do this in two pieces, if you will. The first thing we're going to do is talk with some industry and economic experts. So we have a range of panelists for that. I'd like you all, if you would, to please go ahead and turn your cameras on. And then in the latter portion of this discussion, we're going to bring in some representatives of some of the existing manufacturers here in Arizona. So stay tuned for that. We're going to have a big group as we wrap up uh, towards the end, towards the latter half of this discussion. So welcome. Welcome to James Smith. James is the Economic and Workforce Development Director for Penal County. Pinal County. I don't know why I said that so weirdly. James, I apologize. Uh, we also have Renee Luzon Ben, the Executive Director for the Casa Grande Chamber of Commerce. We have Marisa Walker. She is the Senior Vice President at the Arizona Commerce Authority, and she is the Executive Director for the Institute of Aut Automated Mobility, which means she's got a lot to talk about. So we really appreciate that. And also joining us, I believe she's somewhere, uh, Britta Gross. She is the Managing Director of Carbon Free Mobility for the Rocky Mountain Institute and Orlando Public Utility Commission. So, Britta, I don't see you on camera, but there you are. Oh, sorry about that. Hi, Britta. Uh, I'm going to ask you to start us off because before we get deep into Arizona, it'd be good to be thinking about the national level. Uh, what are you seeing? What's going on with decarbonization of the automotive industry? Where are companies choosing to locate their manufacturing? Answer, by the way, should be Arizona. Uh, how does state policy supporting EVs influence where a manufacturer is going to locate? Perfect. Thank you, John. And, and thank you all for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, let's, I mean, what an exciting time for electric vehicles, right? In the electrification of, of the transportation industry broadly. Let me just paint a, a big, super broad brush on all the things that are happening. And I'm sure everyone listening here today is very aware of, of all the traction 
um, that we're seeing right now in this in this um, in this space. So, I mean, at the federal level, there's no question that, that the administrative is really trying to use this as an economic driver across the United States. Um, big words are infrastructure, domestic manufacturing. I mean, those those themes just come up over and over again. So um, you start to then to look at what's happening across the manufacturers and you start to see um, big announcements. I mean, the Biden administration got together with GM Ford and Stellantis and they made an announcement last year that they were aiming for 50 percent EV sales by 2030. And, a hun- and then GM went further and said, hey, 100 percent EV sales by 2035. So, I mean, you start to hear these big numbers. There's a big wave of EVs coming if we get everything just right, right? We got to get the whole ecosystem right and prepared for this. But the ambition is there and the commitment is there right now. Uh, The administration talks often about 500,000 chargers, EV chargers being put into the ground before 2030. Um, You combine the federal level activity with what's happening at state level So now California announced also a year or two ago that they were aiming for 100% EV sales by 2035. And you start to see where these worlds are all coming together, right? The the talking points are shared between industry, state, and the federal level. They're all connecting. And I think that is the biggest sign of, um, of, of, of commitment and confidence one should have in this market is sort of when these segments of the the marketplace start um, sort of humming the same tune. Um, I think that what I take away from all of this is that EVs are coming and we are really only debating amongst ourselves whether they're coming in large, large volume in 2025, 2028, or 2030. I think that is really the only debate to be having right now. Um, if I circle back to the to the menu, to the national level again, of course, we're going to talk, I think, a little bit later about the um, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, this IIJA, the Jobs Act. I think that that's a really important, again, commitment from the federal level. Uh, that seven and a half billion dollars that will, um, at least in large part, be sent to the states to allocate. So I think this is a huge opportunity for Arizona and every other state here. And then maybe just a couple thoughts about manufacturing. W- where do automakers um, you know, place their manufacturing bets. And then I did, I don't know that it came up in my introduction, but I come out of industry. I was with General Motors for the last 20 years before that aerospace. But, you know, sort of I was involved in the industry and, and looked at sort of what, what goes into some of these decisions. And I will just say that it's a lot of different factors, right? And Arizona's already doing some of these things that are really important. But I might just list a couple things. Um, your business environment matters, right? The incentives, um, access to land, what you're doing uh, relative to property taxes and sales taxes and all those things, the favorable business environment matters. Um, But co-location and proximity also matters. You have some established automaker presence down there. You've already got uh, GM's um, uh, Mesa Proving Grounds. You've got, I think Ford's got a proving ground down there. You've also already attracted a Waymo and GM Cruise automated vehicle test facilities down there. Co-location is a big deal to automakers. It means they've got access to labor, they've got skill sets down there, and it's not as costly to move things around like test vehicles and batteries and so on. Proximity is a really big cost saver for um, automakers and others. And then finally, I'll just suggest that domestic manufacturing is is a really key item on the the federal policy um, on the administration's priority list of things to do. And so there is this big need for the domestic production, not only of vehicles and batteries and the things that go on to electric vehicles, but also charging infrastructure. So don't overlook these big opportunities for all those things that go into charging equipment to come actually from Arizona or from the United States, because today, most of it comes in from overseas. So maybe that's a nice paintbrush of a lot of things that are going on right now that are all very exciting. Very nice. Thank you. And I tell you right now, Maurice is licking her lips. She's like, let me into this conversation because ecosystem, structure, business environment, co-location, like that's her jam, right, Marisa? Uh, so, you know, I think there's so much going on. That, and, and by the way, let me just get this out at the very beginning of the conversation. We call it an electric valley only because calling it autonomous and electric valley seemed a little long. Uh, but they sort of go hand in hand. They can also be decoupled, but we're going to talk about both, I think, to some extent. So Marisa, please, you know, extend this conversation. Let's talk about the business environment. Uh, Let's talk about 
the growth of autonomous and electric vehicle manufacturing industry in Arizona. Uh, and let's talk about the ripple effect that's occurring already. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. And Britta, what a fantastic job. Um, it's been such a pleasure to get to know you because you do bring a really lovely overview to what's happening. And I, I guess um, it seems to me just to kind of pick up on some of the things that you were talking about, um, it, it did strike me, you know, there's just such an exciting time that's happening right now in Arizona with EV manufacturing. But, you know, as Britta was alluding to, Arizona actually has a pretty um, extensive decades long um, legacy of automated um, automotive innovation um, with the proving grounds, both from multiple OEMs like Chrysler and Toyota and for GM that she mentioned, um, but also with our military and defense apparatus, like with the Yuma Proving Grounds, and so our heat and our terrain, and some of the other factors that she mentioned, a really thoughtful regulatory environment. I'm not actually sure when the first automated vehicle um, tested in Arizona, probably far before we really recognized it, but when we think about um the activities of those in the automated vehicle space, um, like Waymo, like Too Simple down in Tucson, Neuro, GM Cruise, which just announced a really exciting partnership to expand its collaboration with Walmart, particularly in the greater Phoenix region, but presumably in other locations around the state. Um, we really start to detect that activity in 2015. And so underlying all that exciting effort was um, the whole economic development ecosystem, folks like uh, James and Renee, and certainly the organization that I work with, that, you know, over a decade ago said, you know what, we're not content being a largely defined as a consumer um, or consumption market. We really think that we have something to play around manufacturing. And so there was an incredible amount of intentionality to think about ways that we could really bolster that. And as Britta was even alluding to, this clustering effect that happens when you start to make it advantageous across sectors around manufacturing, really trying to address the kind of business environment that they need. Um, it really has a powerful effect. And now we're kind of enjoying this notoriety around being a EV, uh, EV Valley. When I think about um, some of the ripple effects, it gets really exciting, right? Because both James and, and Renee will um, reiterate this as well, I'm sure. Just, you know, at the core of it is just the jobs. Um, we don't often think of talent as being part of the supply chain, but it's a critical component of the supply chain and really seeing some dynamic collaborations, which I think, you know, we hope to talk a little bit more about. But Simultaneous to a lot of the exciting developments with the EV manufacturers that we're going to be talking to a little bit later um, on this session is the reality that our major utilities, for instance, just got together, went through, I think, almost a two-year process, a very thoughtful engaging process around developing a transportation electrification plan, which was actually um, endorsed by our policymakers at the Arizona Corporation Commission, and really starting to show strong alignment. And I think this is going to result in addressing what is also a really important um, requirement in this whole mix, which is having the consumers, uh, citizens of Arizona, really start to take a, another look at the opportunities to have EVs. Um, I think I was mentioning to you, John, before we jumped on the call today, shout out to our colleagues from Lucid. I just was listening to a podcast this weekend where they had some journalists. I, I don't know if that's how they would themselves, but they got they got to take one of their vehicles out on the road. They drove around the greater Phoenix area for I think it was almost eight hours. Uh, just got right almost to like 500 miles on a single charge. And so, although there's a long way to still to go, that really starts to address some of the issues that um, I hear out there in the eco space around range anxiety. Mm -hmm. So, just a really exciting time. Lots of opportunities for Arizona. Renee and James, you're both sitting here and you're going, you know, this didn't happen magically. I mean, like there was a ton of work that went into this. And, and I think Marisa was being a little bit humble about the ACA's role in that. But I'm going to I'm going to let you, Renee, have the first crack at that. Like this didn't just appear out of nowhere. Uh, there was a lot of work that had to be done. And uh, if you can give us some of that on the ground perspective, uh, we would really appreciate that because I think we need to understand that and appreciate it in order to keep the momentum going and support you. Uh, I think that the credit for the, the 
the work in getting lucid here, you know, kudos to our city and the economic development office and the mayor for being forward thinking and working with, with partners such as lucid and getting them here. Um, location is perfect. I-8, I-10, we're at the crossroads there. But I think what's really neat, and, and Marissa talked about this workforce, um, in, in knowing that Lucid was going to need a skilled workforce, um, the state of Arizona, Pinal County, city of Casa Grande, and Central Arizona College partnered to develop Drive 48, which is a training center at the Signal Peak campus of Central Arizona College. It um, is a state-of-the-art advanced manufacturing training center, and it features cutting edge robots. You go in there and you see some of these robots moving around that these workers will experience in their real life at Lucid. So this is a great place to give them that first exposure to Lucid's operations. They, um, it, the main training room is a large open area with multiple assembly robots, as well as um, uh, it's used for training the technicians in programming, maintenance, problem solving, troubleshooting, safety, general system requirements, and more. Um, it also has a, a focus on Lucid's manufacturing and logistics topics, including production systems, lean manufacturing principles, Six Sigma and process improvement and such, um, environmental health and safety topics, and shop-specific hands-on training, fine-tuning their skill set on, on the line. And so it's pretty exciting. It opened in January of 2021. And by July of 21, they had already um, brought over 400 new hires through that program. Um, and it's, it's okay, but let's, let's get a little more backstory because you don't just go to Staples and get some robot uh, and, and open <laughs> up a training center in two weeks. So, I mean, talk about what it takes to get that done and the investments that are being made and have well, been made. I, I think that, you know, it was all, it was all about the planning that Lucid was getting their their buildings started going vertical. And at the same time, these partners came together and talked about what does Lucid need? They worked in partnership, obviously, with Lucid. I'm pretty sure Lucid supplied the robots <laughs> and, and Mike can certainly follow up on any of this and let me know what I might have missed. Um, it is, I went uh, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely correct. We just supplied the robots, but there was a huge partnership starting five years ago. And yeah, and it's, uh, it took, took time, but it came together. So appreciate it. It is awesome. I was able to go on a tour at an open house this past um, summer, and it really is neat. You can take pictures in part of it, but others are very proprietary, including the whole drive chain section. And it's um, it is a great start, and, and I think that it also provides a location for training for other EV as well, so it is it is not limited. Um, and what's really neat, as you look at EV now in Casa Grande, thinking about how our little town, which we're not a little town anymore, we're a city of about 60,000 residents, but Lucid is a game changer for us, um, and, and as well as we have so much else going on. But, you know, when you look around maybe 10 years ago when Culver's opened on the other side of I-10 near the promenade, in went some Tesla charging stations. Well, now we have, um, and this is easily found on a Google search. I knew they were there, but I confirmed who's what. We have Tesla superchargers. We have Volta charging stations over on the promenade. When you think about proximity for the traveler, I-10 and our main thoroughfare, we have EVgo. Um, at the promenade, Electrify America has charging stations by the Walmart. And I, through a partnership, uh, the city's just installed some charging stations. They're not on the map yet, but the rest of them are. So this is exciting. Not only are we building electric cars here, and I really appreciate Mike's backdrop because it is a beautiful vehicle. Um, it is, it's nice to know that people who are coming through, whether it be just for the day or they're looking for um, a place for lunch, they can charge their vehicle and they remember Casa Grande can serve them. And, and I think that kind of looking forward when you look at, uh, well, this is actually just kind of a neat thing. We don't get a lot of really young people like 20 somethings coming into the chamber checking out our lobby, but it's really neat when you talk to this young man and he's like, yeah, I have, a, I have an interview with Lucid. So I wanted to check out Casa Grande instead of living in the Phoenix area, thinking of just moving down here to work for them. So thank you, Lucid, for bringing more residents. And things are crazy with that growth and the need for housing. Um, and lastly, awesome. 
This is really neat. So we have a, a business that is, so you've got Lucid, which is new and, and technology. And then you have Cactus Mine, which bought um, a mine that had been dormant since, or had been not used since 1984. Mm. And Cactus Mine came in and they've gone through the purchase of this and making some changes. And their vision is to have um, like a zero carbon footprint with the production of their copper. So the tailings that are existing, they're installing a solar field. Panels are gonna be going up there and they, they plan. So Mike, you guys need to have some trucks in the near murky future because they're looking at another manufacturer for using electric trucks on their premises for like the regular pickup trucks, not those big mining trucks, but they're gonna be using electric trucks as part of their day-to-day -day business operations. So when you look at how electric vehicles and the readiness and partnerships are occurring in, in our part of Arizona, it's kind of running the gamut. By the way, that was Mike Boyke who dropped in, general manager of Lucid, and we're gonna be talking with him more later. Thank you, Renee. Uh, you know, so much going on. The future is happening in Casa Grande, which is really awesome. James, you've got another viewpoint on Casa Grande and Pinal County as a whole. Um, let's talk more about that. Like follow up on what Renee's comments were there and, and factoring in your background with autonomous vehicles. Yeah. What do you see as the growing economic opportunity for Pinal County? So one of the things that made this position, I've only been uh, uh, here in Pinal County for about three months, but one of the things that made it so attractive was the presence of Nicola and Lucid in Pinal County and the opportunities that, that uh, arise to really become the capital of electric vehicles, of autonomous vehicles, because there's so much infrastructure that's been talked about. And I won't go into too much of, uh, I, I don't wanna go over too much of what's already been said, but when you consider that Pinal County really is the crossroads of what is gonna be at some point, two mega regions, when Tucson and Phoenix are truly connected, uh, we will be at the crossroads. We, the transportation infrastructure that's here makes it really attractive for manufacturers, uh, I believe. Uh, the fact that we're in the middle of two research universities and the technology that comes out of that. And one of the other things that, that I don't think was really hit on, but it, you know, after spending about 12 years in, in Chandler, one of the things that you realize is that Silicon Valley likes Arizona. Intel has continued to, to invest here and move different components of their business here because it's so close. The technology can be developed in Silicon Valley and it can be manufactured and implemented here in Arizona. So I think that's another thing that really makes Arizona attractive and, and makes Pinal County, I think a great opportunity as well, is that, uh, you know, our, our proximity to Silicon Valley, um, you know, obviously we've, we've talked about automotive testing and, and Pinal County also has a VW and Nissan proving grounds uh, testing facilities as well. So, and then, you know, I think one of the things that people aren't aware of and, and, and uh, it's been kind of hit on, but, my time in Chandler, I realized that there was this underlying kind of automotive technology um, uh, 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 ecosystem that people may not be aware of. So like NXP is making chips for vehicles and, and Rogers Corporation. And there's companies that are making cabling for that is so important for automotive uh, uh, applications. But, but, and then you take that a step further where the supply chain, we would never be able to manufacture the internal combustion engine because so many of those suppliers are centered around the upper Midwest. But when you remove those pieces and parts now, and it's kind of a, a little, much more tech, technology and less of the little pieces and parts, I think it really uh, lends itself to Arizona having that supply chain here and being able to manufacture here. Um, and then obviously, uh, as Renee uh, alluded to, uh, the the environment here, what I've found in my short time with Pinal County is the supervisors, the manager, uh, they are very aggressive in terms of this industry. And I think Drive 48 is in, indicative of that. But I think, so not only do we have the positive business environment and climate for this, but I also think that we're training a whole generation of workers uh, for this for this industry going forward. So 
uh, just I, th I think the 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 uh, the underlying uh, factors for success I think are just off the charts here, and I'm really I'm really bullish on on our ability to compete with any region uh, for this industry. So let's build off that literally, right, or metaphorically, however you want to do it. Uh, we're going to do a little mini lightning round amongst the four of you. So each of you are going to answer this question. I got to tell you, I remember as a kid living in the upper Midwest, uh, there was a guy, a friend of mine, whose dad, he made the brushes, the bristle brushes that were like for the garage door and the golf ball washer, but also for the shifter in the car. Mm -hmm. You know, like there were all those small manufacturing parts and pieces that you just talked about, James. It's a little bit different with electric and autonomous vehicles, but nobody's built that yet. Nobody's built that ecosystem yet. So here's the question I'd like all four of you to answer relatively succinctly and quickly, which is this. What more does Arizona and the Arizona business community need to do to support the EV manufacturing industry and to keep us attracting those companies into this state? And James, you're going to go first. We'll go in reverse order the way we went before. You know, I, I guess we, we need to ensure that we have the workforce. I think that is the critical issue that's facing every region right now. So uh, just, I think there'll be a continual stream of people moving to Arizona. It's a desirable place. It's, uh, it's safe, it's, uh, it's the weather and, and all the things that we, we know are great about Arizona, but really making sure that, that we have those people and then that they're trained, I think is gonna be key going forward. So by saying that, you're, you're also saying Drive 48 is not enough. It's a great start, but more of it, right? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, I think so, Drive 48 is a model that probably needs to be replicated many times mm -hmm. over. Okay, so we got Renee and, and Marisa's heads nodding. Renee, what's your what's your take? Are you going to add on to that? You can I am going to add on want. to that. And while there are, you know, it's really what we have in place is great. We need more of it. Um, Drive 48, I know that the chamber participates with a group called uh, Achieve Pinal, which is a subgroup, it's a, a nonprofit operated by the Pinal Alliance for Economic Development. The Chief Pinal is about workforce development and it's about starting when they're young and looking as well as looking at ways to engage high school students in thinking about career pathways. You know, the more we engage younger people into thinking about what's going on and what they can find locally, the more we're growing our own and not necessarily, and, and like creating that, that skilled workforce pipeline for the lucids instead of them having to, you know, have a cast a wide net. So yeah, do what we're doing, wish, more of it. I wish I knew how much of a trend it was that uh, people are quite frankly, young people are quite frankly uh, eschewing college because they know that they can get a good technical training and get a really solid job. They're going to do that. And, and it's not, some people think that's not smart, but a lot of people are realizing actually it probably is really smart. Um, whether it's a coder or somebody working in manufacturing, these are new alternatives for folks, right? And Marisa, you've been nodding your head a whole bunch too. Yeah, no, um, this has been great. I mean, you know, that that's this passion is really, I think, what makes um, the things happening in Arizona so dynamic. I would just add two quick things that one that builds on what James and Renee said, and the governor has $30 million in his proposed budget that got introduced this year to take uh, Drive 48 and really scale that that concept of engaging with uh, community college. So I see a real recognition. And of course, companies like Too Simple and other are already working with community colleges around the workforce that they need. So lots of optimism there. I think the economic development community, I know that at the Arizona Commerce Authority, it's something that we're getting a lot more sophisticated about, and that's illuminating the supply chain, what the gaps are. Um, frankly, the pandemic really illuminated how disruptive and costly that can be for companies if you can't create some predictability and reliability and resilience in it. And so, you know, one of the things that becomes quickly apparent is um, what things are really sensitive to transport and logistic costs? batteries. So a really exciting thing that's happening in Arizona is a real critical mass with core power, in power, a company life cycle that I'm really looking intriguingly at because of um, what I guess they call the circular economy, mm -hmm. where we're really trying to be conscientious about finite materials um, and how we might be better engaged in the recycling of it. So I, I agree with uh, Renee, uh, more and sooner. <laughs> 
So in a quick follow-up on that one, Marisa, and then I'm going to bring in Britta. And I also want to give our manufacturers sort of the two-question warning. About a couple of questions here we get through. We're going to want to bring you guys on real soon. So, Marisa, the question is this. We're talking about more. We keep saying we want more of, more of. Mm -hmm. Are the right people at the table yet? Are there are there coalitions that have yet to be built? Are there? Uh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, no, yeah, look, there's always more people that need to be at the table. But, you know, I'm really encouraged. OK, look at what Arizona Forward's doing and leading this dialogue with their group. There's also a group, interestingly, kind of fostered through the Nature Conservancy that brings together a pretty wide group of public and private sector folks that are really bringing a pragmatic approach and messaging and narrative called AZ Thrives. They've done some really interesting work around the economic development. I think they partnered with Jim Rounds to be able to articulate some of that language. I mentioned the utilities. So I'm starting to see a lot of gravitational pull. And, you know, that's the one thing that Arizona does really well. We're a small state, um, but we collaborate. And as you mentioned, as we started up the conversation, um, a lot of this is the benefit of some real intentionality that went into leveraging those relationships and building on our key assets. So, yeah, I'm really yeah. optimistic. Yeah, you brought up the circular economy. That is actually a, a working committee at Arizona Forward uh, that has a ton of energy and a great, it's a great table with lots of people there. And uh, I encourage anybody on this webinar who hasn't heard about that to check it out. And Britta, we're, we're coming right back into your wheelhouse here when uh, Marisa mentioned the utilities. We've already had this discussion about, is the grid ready? How does the grid get ready for all the demand that's gonna be required here? And I think on that note, Britta, if you could sort of talk a little bit, I mean, I, I think we need to before we talk about it. Just thank our senators Kelly and Cinema for the support of the Infrastructure and Jobs Act. But what does that really mean for our industry in terms of EVs and AVs in Arizona? And how do we start to get some of that work underway? Yeah, thank thanks for that. Yeah, I mean these are big opportunities from the for the states, right? Um, Arizona um, should be well positioned because of their TEP and other efforts in the state, including utility efforts in the state and planning that's been going on to attract a lot of those federal dollars. So, I mean, the federal this this uh, infrastructure, this bipartisan infrastructure bill um, is uh, it looks like about a seven and a half billion dollar plan. Five billion is going to be allocated directly to the states. So we're talking, I suspect for Arizona, I didn't look up your number, but I suspect that's in the tens of millions of dollars to apply to infrastructure. You just want to make sure that you have plans in place to prioritize what you want to do first with those funds that you have and make sure that what you invest in is something that actually provides a really great core of reliable, robust, visible probably DC high, you know, DC fast charging that you can then build upon in subsequent funding cycles and, and even attracting private investment to fill the gaps and, and put more chargers at destinations and, and address your apartment and condominium issues with, uh, you know, at uh, for overnight charging, et cetera. So I think get it right in this initial highly prioritized investment plan, two and a half billion is discretionary. And so that looks like it's very targeted to low income and underserved communities, both urban and rural. So a lot of folks are going to be going after that. There's no reason why Arizona isn't really well positioned today because of all, because of all the planning you've already done to make sure that you can actually uh, participate in that part of the program as well. So I think that's that's where I sort of see um, you know getting ready. And and in fact, if the if the you know build back better plan. Um, or some version of it ever takes hold. Of course, that could be uh, significant uh, additional funding. And of course, that could be you know even bigger than just simply charging infrastructure. We, we're now looking at maybe grid readiness and anticipating again, all these vehicles that are coming in, let's just guess, 25, 28, 2030. I mean, it's coming. So we have to start preparing today for that wave of electrification that's coming. Yeah, it's really it, it is really interesting to try and figure out when, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, I, I I was mentioning to you guys before we got on the call, all through the weekend I'm watching football, but all I'm seeing is ads for new electric vehicles, and it seems like it's coming really quick. Uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it really doesn't matter because it's a lot of work to do, and and that Infrastructure and Jobs Act money is so compelling because two years ago, three years ago, definitely five years ago. These look like really thorny issues with no viable solution. And yet now there's both the thinking and the planning coming together with the money. And so I know everybody keeps talking about it as a once in a lifetime thing, but it kind of is. And uh, we have a really great 
opportunity to take advantage of that because of all the work that everybody in this panel has done in the years leading up to this. Marisa, we're gonna get to our manufacturers right after this last question with you to talk more broadly about Arizona right now. How's the supply chain? What, is sec what sectors need to support manufacturers like Lucid, Nikola, and Electromechanica? And how is Arizona Commerce Authority partnering with other stakeholders around the state to start to make some of those things happen? And you're gonna have to click the button. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was being conscientious and there I go forgetting how to operate Zoom. Yeah, this is a really important issue and um, ACA has strong regional partnerships to really look at, you know, how do we um, think more strategically about not only our existing supply chain, but also thinking of it from a broader regional space. Um, you know, one of the things that I think I alluded to in the Lucid, so we'll have to invite our manufacturer to come back, is that when they were initially looking for sites uh, in the U.S., I don't think Arizona was actually on the, the initial list. It took a little um, tenacity and audacity audaciousness for us to kind of raise our hand and say, hey, you know what, we have a regional approach over here. We've got a real strong over 50 year partnership with the state of Sonora in Mexico that borders Arizona. Um, and they've got a huge board plan. And let's leverage that along with a pretty heavy concentrated um, supply base in that border region that includes Baja, California, as well as Chihuahua, and as I mentioned, Sonora. Um, I also think looking around from the perspective of California, Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, to really understand a more holistic approach to supply chain is going to be a big issue. I know we're asking a lot of questions, digging really deep into the data about where things are produced, how they're moved, um, what's their um, sensitivity, as I mentioned earlier, around transport. So I think, um, you know, there's quite a bit more to do. We continue to look for opportunities to work with the manufacturers that are going to be on the second part of the panel to really identify who goes into your current production. Who can we collaborate with you to um, entice those companies to, to come and locate? But I'll be honest with you, and I'm sure James and Renee can talk about this, we're getting a, a tremendous amount of feedback from the broader automotive ecosystem that's calling into Arizona saying, hey, what is going on over there? How do we how do we get a part of this? How do we start to get engaged with what is taking place and get introductions to these companies? So um, I think just building on that strong collaboration that we've been working on for a number of years now is really going to be um, just exactly the kind of um, critical core competency for us to, to really uh, be able to address the gaps that exist and be a lot more strategic about leveraging those in our region and identifying opportunities to bring those outside of our region, pull them, as James said, pull them from that auto alley that's uh, largely concentrated in the, um, in, the, uh, in the Midwest. Yeah, great, thank you. Renee and James, that was your cue, by the way, if you'd like to chime in, anybody? No, you're holding you're holding your cards. All right, fair enough. Britta, um, one of those one of those continuous questions has popped up in the chat. It's something that people uh, often want to know more about, uh, and that's very simply this: What are the environmental, unintended or otherwise, consequences of EV manufacturing processes, as well as battery disposal and recycling? You know, this. This one, by the way, is personal to me. Like when I first got an electric vehicle, people were like, your vehicle was so wasteful in the manufacturing process that it's just as dirty as my gas in the car. And I went and researched it and got the data and found out that after like 200 miles of driving, that, that, our, that whole idea is debunked. But there's still this whole notion about batteries and everything else. So let's, let's open that subject up, Brett, if you could talk to that a little bit. Yeah, and I'm really happy that those questions, in fact, two of those questions right now um, are related to batteries and recycling. Yeah, let's talk about that because this is this is actually flipped from a from a problem area to a real opportunity area. And I think Arizona is well served to think about this as a real opportunity. Um, the batteries are heavy. You don't want to ship them cross country. So the fact is that you're going to want to have quite a few regional battery processing plants to deal with batteries that either don't pass 
first inspection at a plant where the vehicles are being assembled, or they're in an accident, you got to pull it out of a vehicle and replace it. Um, and so those are the first two things that come to mind is you, you're going to want to start thinking about uh, facilities to actually and, and, and a whole area of, of a supply chain of, for business opportunity to deal with these battery um, issues. And, and, and the other opportunity here in the area of batteries is that the grid in parallel is dealing with some really, really um, tough issues. Um, the grid is going through at, in parallel a transformation, right? Um, wind, solar, um, these renewable sources are going to play a really, really big part in in, uh, in serving the load. And, and what, what comes with solar and wind, of course, is that they're intermittent, right? Cloud cover stops the sun. Um, wind doesn't blow consistently. It's often at night, but not during the day. And so we have these huge opportunities, if we can get energy storage right, to actually um, not have to keep tapering off on these sources when they're fully, you know, sun's fully shining, wind's fully blowing. We need to be able to collect that in these batteries. So this, this other opportunity is that all of these batteries that are coming off of vehicles, they, they may not be able to accelerate fast enough after 10 or 20 years onto an on-ramp on an expressway, but they've got a lot of energy storage still left in them. And those batteries are perfectly good to serve grid needs. And so this whole um, wonderful intersection between what the grid needs for stationary energy storage purposes and what's coming out of, into and out of the transportation field is a huge opportunity and a win-win across the board. So think about that. Um, I think there's no only upside here in this area um, going forward. And that's where your utilities, of course, are gonna play a very big role in helping drive that demand and um, and help determine these solutions for uh, what they need on the grid. Dang it, that's how I did it. Perfect, thank you, Britt. I appreciate you bringing that through. And also a uh, point to the chat box, uh, Joe Dowling put a, put a, uh, a link in there uh, for an article regarding J.B. Straubel. He's one of the original heroes of Tesla, one of the original co-founders of Tesla, who now runs a battery recycling uh, operation. Uh, great article. Thank you, Joe, for that. I want to get our manufacturers to come on and join us on camera here, please, if you would. Uh, Mike Boyke has already shown himself. Mike, how are you? Welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, so glad to be here, John. Thank you for having us. Have you been biting your tongue the last 35 or 40 minutes or so? Oh, it's been a great conversation. Yeah, I've been right. I mean, you know, I wanted to jump in, but I'm like, yeah, I'm going to wait. <laughs> well, what's on your mind? Go ahead and go ahead and jump. I'm not even going to make you answer one of my questions. Uh, no, I'll let you. I'll about? let you introduce everybody else first, and then we'll. I, I all think right. We'll, think all that. of us will have, will have input. That's good. Appreciate that. Also from Electromechanica, it's Julia Barra. She is a plant manager. Thank you for being here today, Julie. How are you? Great. Thank you for inviting Electromechanica and myself to participate. I think what's really cool is we've got three manufacturers and they're all kind of doing different things and they're really amazing. So exactly. All, we're we're yeah. supplemental to both uh both Lucid and Nicola. We, you know, Nicola takes the product to a hub and then we can do the last mile. And then Lucid is such a beautiful, the air is such a beautiful vehicle. Um, we are lower priced, more aspiration, Lucid is aspirational. We're the entry level. Um, so we might be somebody who owns a Lucid might have a solo as their second vehicle, as their toy, as their little commuter vehicle. Um, we do try to address right sizing mobility. So if it's just you driving your car, we want to use the smallest amount of material to get you from point A to B. Um, you don't necessarily need a seven person vehicle to get yourself to work and back. So, you know, we all do uh, supplement each other pretty well, if you ask me, the vehicle manufacturers that we have in the area. Wait, what? I don't need a seven person SUV to go to the grocery store? <laughs> Depends well. who you're buying groceries for, right? Hey, also, I want to say good morning to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, how are you? From from, uh, from Nicola, she's the Global Head of Sustainability and Social Responsibility. How's it going? Good morning. Thank you for being here. Yeah, we'd be happy to uh, find people to haul uh, the solos and the lucids to all their customers. So it's, it's a great partnership. It really, I mean, are, are you totally blown away, Elizabeth, by like, how did this happen? Like Lucid and Electromechanica and Nikola all being together. I mean, does it surprise you that it happened that way? 
No, I mean, I think, you know, and first of all, as you know, as I was thinking about the questions that we had talked about and different things, and I'm listening to the panelists earlier, I'm like, man, they don't need me on this. I was, they were just getting me super excited. The enthusiasm um, alone would draw people here to Arizona, but there's just so many things that, that bring us together and make this a great place for, um, EV manufacturers, you know, you've heard a lot about it, the, the workforce, um, the business friendly environment, um, even just the, the weather, which I know for those of you that know me and I, you know, I'm, I work with Arizona for quite a bit. I love the warm weather. Um, but it's not just that, you know, that warm weather, when you start talking about the proving grounds and you start talking about wanting to be a fully sustainable company with solar panels on your roof and, and all of those things, you know, it all kind of plays in. So I'm not surprised. Um, and it's motivating and it's awesome, especially as we start talking about the, um, you know, the broader ecosystem, which I know we're going to get into. So no. Yeah, so let's so let's get into that. And by the way, yes, Elizabeth is our plant. She is an Arizona Forward Board member. We are so glad to have her on the Arizona Forward Board. She is an amazing contributor there. Uh, Elizabeth, I'm going to start with you and we'll go around to all three of the manufacturers. How do we continue the momentum? Because like I said earlier, it didn't happen by magic and the rest of it's not going to happen by magic either. So how do we secure more EV related manufacturing? How do we get better supply chain situation? Yes, we've got some infrastructure in terms of highways, but what else do we need? Yeah, and I, you know, there were so many great things that were mentioned. Like I said, the the workforce and um, all of those things we just talked about. I think one of the things that um, we're starting to work on, and and that the panelists brought up, is that there there's this whole ecosystem and life cycle of these vehicles. And and so one of the things I think about when we start talking about clusters and proximity is not only in that manufacturing part of the life cycle, but, you know, for us to have the right business environment um, to demonstrate and, and bring these, these vehicles to scale, this may be a little bit different on the, on the heavy duty side than the, than the passenger side, but, um, you know, for our customers to have um, the support and incentives that they need to start implementing and for us to have those implementations close to home where we can monitor and support and, and do all of that um, is invaluable as well. So as we start, you know, just making sure that that, that environment um, the supportive environment is not only in the manufacturing side of it, the supply chain side of it, it's also in the in use. And then going back to what we were just talking about with Brita and the circular economy, um, how do we sort of continue to um, ensure that the entire life cycle of our, of our equipment is sustainable. And so having Brita is absolutely right. We need to do this regionally and, and to only have it in Arizona wouldn't, um, make sense, but to ensure that we are creating an environment for, you know, the recycling, um, reuse, refurbishment, secondary life, all of those options of the, of the batteries is important too. Great. Mike, same question to you. What more do we need to do? And then I just saw something pop into the chat too. And Elizabeth, you're well, also welcome to, to comment on this is, you know, when it comes to your manufacturing facilities themselves, and Britta mentioned the sort of, hey, there's a huge transformation going on in the electrical industry in, in, in general. Uh, are you guys doing anything in terms of solar or battery as backup for fossil fuel generators? So, Mike, to you. Yeah, well, first, uh, th thanks again, John, for having us. And uh, I want to give a, a thank you to um, Ms. Walker for recognizing that we were um, uh, voted number one for for range uh, by Inside EVs, which is an independent study. So there was a lot, there was a, thanks Marissa. Uh, there was a lot of, um, of you know, people questioning, are you guys, can you guys really get 500 miles to charge? You, you guys were, you guys were, had nobody in the car, you were pushing the car, you were getting 500 miles, but uh, to have it, an independent study done by an outside source and at 70 miles an hour, we, we were still getting 500 miles to uh, to a single charge. So it's real. So then thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate it. 
And, um, you know, the, the drive 48, um, yeah, that's a great model. You know, we look at, uh, it's a great model and that's, that was the intent of let's start this training center. Let's work with the, the, the CAC and, um, the chamber and, and, and the city and the county and state. And how, how do we train our workforce? And that was a great model. I think we have to expand on that as well. Um, the, as far as solar, yeah, we, we're adding, if you guys uh, drive by our, our lot right now, we just, uh, we just put in solar in our parking to, for the first um, our first phase of it. We're going to be adding a lot more in the future. And uh, solar is absolutely a, um, a part of our footprint that we end up uh, that we will be putting in more as we as we move forward. Um, as, as loose is only in the first stage right now. We're in phase one, and if you as you see our site, we're we're quickly expanding in the phase two. So we're we're going to add 2.85 more 2.85 million square feet here within the next year. And now we'll have cars coming out of that uh, factory by the end of this year. So, and as soon as we're done with that, we'll be planning phase three. So we're, we're, we're going to be, we're going to be rolling and uh, more solar will be going up as we go. Um, so, so, so I have to, on, on your question, I have a lot of things to say, you know, about building, building upon it. You know, the roads is uh, for us, as we start to, as we start to ramp up, that's more trucks that have to that have to come into Arizona. That's more goods that have to come through here. And you know, the widening of I-10, and if anybody ever listens to me, it's my number one concern is I-10. You know, I need that need, I need that lifeline. To me, that's the lifeline of Lucid with our warehouse up in Tempe um, currently. Um, I need I need those trucks to make it down here. So continuing infrastructure on roads is number one. Um, we talked about workforce, and it's been a great partnership with the ACA. It's really helped us to find very um, high talented people. There is a, a great blue collar workforce here in Arizona that's um, that's been amazing. Um, with a little bit of uh, training that we've gone through the training center, I'm more than pleased with the workforce that we have. Um, I think it's been exceptional. Um, one of the concerns that comes up is, is absolutely is housing. As we start to ramp up our factories, we need affordable housing for people to um, come into the area. I know there's a, a big push. I know there's a lot of housing permits going on in the area, but I, I, don't, I don't think you can build them fast enough as fast as we're growing. So the faster we can get more affordable housing into the area, I think that'll help the region as well. And that'll help Casa Grande and Pinal County as well. You know, a lot of people are, are stuck with this uh, decision to come from the valley, you know, from, from, from north to, to the south and, and starting to build up the area here a little bit more is absolutely going to help us. Those yeah, are the two sure. things I would say is uh, the, the housing and the roads. Uh, I think we need, need to keep, we need to keep rolling on, no pun intended, but uh, th those are the things that, that need to happen in my, my opinion. Yeah. And, and I, I will, uh, I will amend your statement, even though you didn't ask me to, I like to call it, <laughs> I like to call it attainable housing, right? Because attainable housing. Yes. You need, you need a, and it needs to be attainable for every level of, employment that you have you know there are going to be people who want certain kinds of housing there are going to be other people who need other certain kinds of housing and then there are the people who support those people like teachers who need to be able to attain housing so that they can teach the kids or the families that you're employing so yeah there's a lot of work to be done there for sure julie we've had you sit on the sidelines too long jump in here talk about what you guys are seeing from your perspective uh, well i would piggyback onto mike's statement about not just housing, but the infrastructure to support a workforce, right? And you have all ranges of salary and all different types of educational background. Um, being a lower entry point vehicle, um, one of the challenges we have, um, I believe Britta may have brought this up earlier. Um, when it comes to people who live in apartment complexes and have a carport, they don't necessarily have some place to charge an EV. Um, carports are perfect for solar. Um, so it'd be nice to get some of those where people could just plug into the carport location and be able to charge a sub $20,000 vehicle, right? Um, and that would will enable electrification uh, among different income ranges. Um, which you do need when you're when you're manufacturing, you do need employees of all levels and all skill sets. Um, but that goes with food, restaurants, uh, activities to do outside of work, parks, um, nature, uh, entertainment. Um, 
fortunately, we're a little bit closer to Phoenix, so um, it's a little easier for us. I would imagine a little further out, um, it can be a challenge and people probably want to drive in uh, to the city more to do spend some of their free time. Um, but wouldn't that be nice to have those uh, facilities local so that people can stay in the town? Um, so in addition to those, the how do you support the workforce, um, schools and restaurants and all of that? Um, the other thing that we're challenged with out here is availability of commercial property, commercial real estate. Um, I heard a figure not too long ago that the availability is five to five to ten percent of, of commercial properties are available. So you know, all of our uh, tier one suppliers, tier two suppliers are really going to struggle to find a place to either co-locate or relocate their businesses out here. So that's one of the huge challenges too. I think that as soon as a building goes up, even before it's complete, it's rented out. Um, so the infrastructure in our area is great. There, the East Valley has done remarkable with preparing the roads um, and gridding the areas for commercial development. It's just, and residential, it just doesn't seem to be happening fast enough for us. That was a huge opening, Marisa, Renee, James, maybe even Britta. Uh, does anybody want to talk about sort of the landscape on that? Britta, maybe we start with you. Uh, no, I double down on everything and I apologize because I'm reading questions over in the chat and there are great oh. questions coming in. So I'm sorry, but no, I, I, mean, I totally agreed on all those comments there uh, that, that Julie in particular was just more recently making. Okay, Renee, I saw I'm your hand. I'm happy up. to jump in, uh, uh, although it's just a little bit of re reiteration, it's not happening fast enough. However, we have several projects uh, going on in the Casa Grande area that kind of change the landscape of housing. So it's um, apartment rentals and, and bungalow type apartments. So giving, giving a little more diversity to uh, options that are available. But if they could have been built uh, last month or six months ago, that probably would have been perfect for Lucid and, and their people coming down here. Um, but no, we have a lot going on and, and our city council, our um, leadership at the city are very cognizant of the needs going on and working to expedite what they can. Yeah, James, we started this conversation talking about making sure we had an EV supportive ecosystem, but what we really need is a community supportive ecosystem. So, uh, you know, your thoughts on that? Yeah, one of the things that Julie mentioned that I, I definitely know is the case in Pinal County, we need to get developers comfortable that they can build spec buildings at the, and that there's a, there are users that would be interested in taking those buildings. So it's definitely one of the things that I would like to work with our communities on is to, uh, to, to present some of these opportunities to our developers and get them confident with building speculative buildings so that there are the those opportunities for suppliers to move in quickly. Uh, I, we, we know they need to, to, uh, to move quickly at the speed of business. And uh, right now we just don't have a lot of buildings in Pinal County and, and it's something we, we definitely need to address. I know less than zero about commercial real estate, but five to 10% availability sounds dangerously low. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. And, and, and let me jump in here. If, if no one has really measure, uh, mentioned the building codes, building codes are one of the fastest ways today to sort of um, get it right. Get just a regular outlet, a 120 volt outlet in the, in the garage is plenty to charge these vehicles for most of Americans driving ranges, right? Most Amer 80 percent of Americans travel less than 40 miles a day. I can I can charge that in a level one outlet. That's just a simple kitchen outlet in 10 hours overnight while I sleep. So just getting the buildings right, the apartments, the condos, the single family homes, et cetera, getting that right today saves consumers thousands of dollars later on when they have to retrofit it and you have long raceways that need to be built or the capacity of the panel isn't enough. So, you know, those kinds of things also create a very favorable environment for EVs um, in the marketplace. So, and I'll just note that there's been a bunch of questions that have come up that have been more specific and getting a little deeper into things like batteries. I'm gonna leave those alone because I think we've got a bunch of other things that we wanna talk about. I would encourage any of the panelists, however, to go in and chime in on those discussions if you are 
available to do so. We really appreciate that. Or maybe we can do some follow up even after the conversation as well. Um, I think we've talked workforce, we've talked ecosystem and community. Um, we've only barely, only a few people have commented just a little bit on what Britta introduced about this idea of renewable energy for the plants. And Elizabeth, I wanna come back to you on that one. Um, talk about what Nicola is thinking about in terms of clean energy goals or, or how you're gonna run your operation relative to the transformation of the grid. So you're maybe just a little bit ahead of, of where um, we're ready to talk about at this point. Um, okay, sorry like, about that. No, you're good. You're good. Having just moved into this role and and kind of bringing it all together, as you know, I mean, we're, we're very focused on being um, sustainable throughout the life cycle of our products, our operations, et cetera. So um, as Mike was saying, we're just at the part, we're kind of finished point Phase, we call it phase point five um, of our plant um, are starting on, on the rest of that and then looking to build phase two and build it out. Um, but we hope to be able to announce um, some um, initiatives here soon. Nice, thank you. Julie, how about you? So I think we're a little further behind um, because our plant is currently being built. Um, certainly we have a concern about uh, proper use of resources. Um, that's the whole point of the solo to begin with. Um, we have a little bit of concern with being next to Mesa Gateway Airport. And we, we do have some regulations that we'll have to look through um, when it comes to something like solar, where you've got some reflection. Um, being next to the runway is a little challenging. So yeah, yeah we do need to investigate those uh, further those options further, um, but certainly recycling is a concern. Optimizing use of any sort of resource is, is a concern of ours as well. Mike, since you're the guy adding two to three million square feet and already churning out cars, what, what about you? Yeah, we started working with you know our um, provider for electricals, APS, from the beginning. And um, it was, we, we looked at that footprint um, from from day one, and um, you know one of the one of the things, even though we started out with a small phase one, one of the things we invested in was a transmission, was a go sixty nine kV transmission um, from the grid instead of uh, going through a, a distributed network, so that that was more efficient. Um, and I'm happy to hear that you know APS has been really you know uh, you know working to use more renewable, fifty uh, percent of the. Uh, electrical coming into us right now is renewable. Um, so, and that's, uh, and that will increase over time. You know, APS has got some, some goals and this is one thing uh, I, I'll say when we looked at Arizona, this is one thing um, that we really looked at for sustainability, you know, as a company, it's, 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 it's to our core, you know, and uh, it's good to have partners that we're, we're seeing, uh, seeing the same vision as we were. So we're we're going down. Uh, we we look at very very hard. We're very hard when we look at water and electrical and the, our usages in our in our design. It all starts in in the design of the factory. All right, guys. John, I would just mention. Oh, I just ahead. mentioned. Yeah, I just mentioned just to complement some of that conversation. You know, the utilities have always been a strong economic development partner for the within the state. They're right there at the table when we're talking these deals. But one of the things that's been really exciting, for at least the last couple of years, just a real intentionality around getting their head, um, getting patched in around our pipeline. Um, and I'm sure this works down to our regional partners too, so that they can start to think about planning. I mean, Mike, I really commiserated with you about the remarks about I-10 because for a lot of these kind of investments and plans, um, anything dealing with transportation takes years and years to be able to plan um, and prioritize and then literally to construct and execute. And so the earlier that we can get these partners engaged around what the future requirements are going to be, the more that we'll be able to respond to that. Um, so anyway, just wanted to toss that out there as well. That's great. Perfect. Thank you. So manufacturers, this is what I call the freeform section of this conversation. I'm going to ask you one one question, but I can you can take it any way you want to go. And I'm going to start with Mike and say simply this. What about state policy? What about Arizona state policy? How 
Is it working for you? And what maybe you would suggest for changes in state policy to be able to influence a positive environment for the EV manufacturing sector? We talked about all kinds of reasons why Arizona has been attractive. How do we stay attractive? I promise not to talk about the gas tag with uh, with mayor, you know, with the mayor online. But, uh, the, you know, there, I think we have a, you know, I, I really do think the relationship with the, with the states and uh, the city and the county. I think um, the, the state sees, you know, uh, I am, which is another a nod to Arizona is uh, they, they see their forward thinking and, and knowing that the policies have got to have got to change. Um, to a, a new a new tomorrow where the electric vehicle is going to is going to dominate, um, and it has to change. There, and uh, I see some of it coming, but um, you know the, the policies have got to come in favor and 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 enable those. Um, the, the taxes is is a, is, and I understand the tax base has to come from somewhere, but uh, I, we just hope we don't mind coming to the table, you know. But we want we also don't want to come to the table and. And in a fair, we want to come in a fair and equitable way that uh, that uh, EVs um, are going to bring the future. But we also don't want to be, you know, uh, you know, I have to pay because of that. Um, there are some policy changes. I do see some of it coming um, and I'm hopeful that we continue with uh, the progress that we're seeing. By the way, by bringing up the gas, by not bringing up the gas tax, you do bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> on purpose. That's okay. <laughs> Elizabeth, what about you? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with Mike. I think it's been a, a pretty favorable environment. Um, I would say as we look forward, you know, on the on the heavy duty side, um, I talk about the diesel has had about a hundred years on us. Um, and so we need we need a little bit of time, a little bit of um, help to catch up. Like um, Mike said, um, you, we know that we can't be reliant on um, grants and incentives and, and credits um, throughout the life cycle, but we do need some time to catch up. And, and some of that, um, you know, preparing the infrastructure um, on the heavy duty side, um, unfortunately, they cannot. Um, recharge at a on a 110 volt charger in a few hours at night. It's it's um, a significantly uh, more complex um, and large problem to solve, especially and two when you bring in not only battery electric trucks but um, fuel cell trucks and the generation of hydrogen and APS. Um, hopefully, you saw. Um, was really progressive in working with us on on providing a rate for high for um, generating hydrogen to, to really start pushing that forward. So um, I think starting to look at how do we build out this infrastructure in a um, coordinated fashion across the um, spectrum of vehicles that we're seeing um, and helping the early adopters in, in um, implementing is, is going to be key. Julie, this is your crack. What do you think about uh, how we can continue to stay attractive here in Arizona for manufacturers? From what I know so far is the city of Mesa and the state of Arizona have been so welcoming um, and just so important to Electromechanica selecting Arizona for our location. Um, but I would agree that, you know, keep keep investing in infrastructure um, support the early adaptation, the, the early adopters who want to get into uh, electric vehicles. Um, electric trucking is going to be an interesting thing as well, right? You do need a lot of infrastructure and support. Um, but as, as the lower end of electric vehicles, you do need some infrastructure and support as well, right? Because this, these are not the people who, the, the customers that we have are not necessarily the people that have an extra $2,500 to put a charging station in their home. But, you know, you can get away with a 110 outlet um, and charge the vehicle. But in some in some types of housing, that's just not readily available. So, um, continuing to su support early ad adoption adoption of electric 
vehicles um, is pretty key to all of our successes. And, you know, th this group right here is really fun because it's it's so it's going to have to be so collaborative. Right. Um, there's so much potential for overlap with suppliers and infrastructure and um, maintenance, you know, having using some of the same tools and equipment that the other manufacturers use is helpful for us because that means that service technicians are readily available and nearby um, and replacement equipment is available because there are other people using the same equipment. So all of these kinds of collaboration, collaborative efforts just benefit all of us. Uh, and all those who appreciate Travis's idea, um, let us know. <laughs> If you didn't see it in the chat already, he says, as revenue from the gas tax drops, you know, we can just supplement that with a dispensary tax. And it's all green. <laughs> Wasn't my joke, people. If you don't <laughs> laugh at it, it's not my fault. Hey, Mike, um, first of all, congratulations on being 2022's Motor Trend Car of the Year. That's pretty amazing. Uh, thank you so oh. much. Uh, we're, I can't tell you how excited we are for that, for that award. Second of all, uh, I think what we haven't done, we're spending a lot of time looking forward. Let's talk about looking backward just a little bit and just to, just to establish how well we're doing and, and, and or not doing. But, but let's talk about the successes, the successes that Arizona has seen that we need to build off of. And we'll start with you. Uh, well, some, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Some of um, the, I, I will say that uh, Arizona's done a great job of of marketing itself and putting in infrastructure. So the infrastructure for, for us was always key. And I think it's good to see them um, like I-10 because I, I can't go a day without talking about I-10, but I see a lot of energy around still um, in, in forums like this of talking about what else needs to get done um, and then progressing forward. I see Arizona progressing and then and, and starting back from 2015 when we first came to Arizona and started talking. And then that was, I can't believe it's been seven years ago, but there's been a lot of um, um, advancements over, over that time and more companies are coming here, more people are looking. There's a, a, a say a sense that electrical vehicles is the future and, and it's moving forward. And, and I know what we talk about every day and um, we are, I, I see Arizona as a leader and I still, and moving forward, will continue to lead and not just, um, in the region, but I think in the entire country of uh, being able to ha have that opportunity and we, we shouldn't lose focus of that opportunity. It's hard to get the things, the ball rolling, but now we've got to keep it rolling. But there's been a, been a lot of advancements, but we have work to do. There's, there's no doubt we have, we're just getting started here. We, we have more to do. Elizabeth, how about you? Take a look back. Let's talk about accomplishments. Let's talk about how far we've come. There's, I think that's a great question. I mean, we've come, I think, like Mike said, we've come a long way in a short period of time, really, when you look at look at it. Um, you know, you think about, we talk about um, how fast things are moving. Um, you know, we put a shovel in the ground in our plant in, I think it was July 2020, and we have our first trucks rolling off the line. And so just that speed of, of being able to carry out the dream, quite frankly, um, you know, has been amazing here. And um, like Mike said, we have, we have a ways to go, um, but I think um, and improvements that we can make, whether it be infrastructure and workforce um, support in general, um, but there, there are a lot of things. There's, there's probably not a lot of places in the country where you know we could have done something like that. At least in, in Nicola's case, and I'm sure um, Julie and Mike would would echo that. That um, you know, being able to go from shovel in the ground to vehicles off the line in in just over a year, um, I think speaks well to the supportive um, ecosystem that's here. Yeah, it's no small task. I mean, everybody thinks like, oh, you just take the gas engine out and you put the battery in and it all just happens. But I mean, I've been following this industry for, I don't know how long, 15 years. I don't think anybody, any manufacturer has ever met its initial, its initial projection. 
like, oh, we're, you know, because, because it is a reinvention. It's a reinvention of a fundamental piece of utility in people's lives that has to be safe. It has to be reliable. It has to essentially be perfect as it rolls off the line. You guys have made those investments and you've done that hard work. And I know you've had sleepless nights, Julie. I know that's happening with you guys too. Um, talk, but talk about how far you've come and, and the accomplishments that you have achieved. Well, um, none of this was here eight months ago. So in yeah. a short amount of time, we've got keys to our temporary PDI facility and we've got a plant being built. Uh, groundbreaking was in May 2021. Um, we expect to move in over the summer and start facilitizing. So there's been a lot of work to get to the vehicle to this stage that you see behind me. Um, there's going to be a lot more work required to get the manufacturing facility up and running. Um, but being able to select a location and move in and start start building is huge accomplishment. Um, we also have met some of our early on goals here, me and my department. Um, there's a couple more hurdles to go. Um, what, what I would like to see it continue is with the state and um, the unit, local universities, programs like UTI, you know, university, um, Arizona State, ASU, UTI, um, and then the high schools continuing to pr push some leading ed edge technologies, but also some very basic fundamentals, right? We, um, we have... Uh, we have to continue to teach our children how to use tools, hand tools, screwdrivers, wrenches, hammers, you know, uh, read a tape measure. Some some very fundamental things are are so practical and so useful and so helpful. Um, I've seen us get away from that a little bit. Um, some a lot of hands on skills uh, and not to go too far down that road. But we we have brought on some great people. They have, there's great infrastructure here. We've made some fantastic hires. Um, I could not be happier with the, the workforce that we do have. And we're a little bit behind Mike and Elizabeth both in, in uh, staffing up um, just because we're a little bit newer. But that has been fantastic. And we've met with some wonderful organizations that are local, um, other supporting, supporting businesses in the area. Um, it, first responders have been great. Um, so, you know, just getting established is a really huge accomplishment in my opinion. Um, and so we, we can't thank the supporting community enough. Nice. All right. I think we have enough time to pull this off if we're all respectful of each other's time. I want to bring all the panelists back on camera and I'm going to pass around the magic wand, all right? Each one of you gets a crack at the magic wand. And what you're going to do with that magic wand is you're going to say, if it were up to me, this is what I would change in the next one to three years in Arizona, such that we could ensure that Arizona becomes like Detroit was for gas cars, right? Like we become the center of electric vehicle and autonomous vehicle production and innovation. All right? That's the, that's the rule. So there's one, two, three. I think we have time. I think we can pull this off. We're going to start with Britta. I am handing you the magic wand. All right. Uh, you know what? I'm going to expand business in Arizona, and we're going to go take over basically the domestic production of EV charging equipment. It's all global right now. Um, very few manufacturers, a lot of global folks don't know where to bring those plants to the U.S. proactively, get engaged, and bring those guys to Arizona. Nice. Marissa, the wand is yours. God, kudos, Britta. That's exactly what we need to look at. Uh, that's, And this is all part of this earlier discussion we were having, John, about really digging deep into the supply chain, really understanding where things are taking place, what things make sense to happen in your own particular market or from a regional perspective. So I hate to just say, yes, almighty, that was perfect, but that's exactly what we need to be focused on over the course of the next few years. It will be a little longer play, Britta, but I think we've got to jump on that and build on the stuff that we've already been doing. Nice, very nice. Brene, the magic wand is in your hand. Well, you know, I think I'm going to jump on what our mayor just said in chat. You know, if we could just make I-10 happen now, 
You're welcome, Mike. That's what we need. And that would be my magic wand. It is problematic now. It's going to take a while to happen. So the magic wand would remove obstacles and speed up progress. Nice. James, how about you? Uh, how about uh, replicating more of Drive 48, getting more of a trained workforce so that the, the manufacturers can come here? We, we adjust and adapt drive, the Drive 48 model to the supply chain so that we're training people to supply the materials that the manufacturers need. And uh, we have the workforce to support this industry going forward. Julie, Elizabeth, and Mike, I feel like we're singing the right song, but you haven't had a chance to get the magic wand yet. So, Elizabeth, it's yours. I just need a magic wand to tell me how to get off mute first. <laughs> um, <laughs> someone to teach me. Gosh, that's hard when you when you're further down the line because I was like infrastructure, workforce, and then I'm like, what? Did, um, so without you can having one, if you want, you don't have to make up something new. You don't have to make up something entirely new if you can't. Well, those two, I mean, and I would, um, you know, obviously we need the the roads to bring everything in as well. Um, but that the, um, you know, infrastructure, I think in general and the workforce, I think is is really going to start to bubble up quickly. So how we can do, I and mean, we've talked about all, you know, how broad that is. Um, I think the, the quicker we can kind of bring a lot of those things to fruition, um, it'll help us in the long run. Great, thank you. Julie, the wand is in your hands. Manufacturing is such a rewarding career. Um, you, you're, you get to solve problems on a daily basis and, and put product in customers' hands and make people happy. Um, but to do that, you need people. So I would, I would drive to uh, encourage pride in the skilled trades. Right. We need to we need to make these desired careers and we need to know we need to make people know that these are great jobs. You should take pride in the work that you do. Um, it, it's such a great contribution to the community that you have these these skills and talents and we can put them to use. Very nice. Mike, you get the last word. The magic wand is in your hand. Hey, thanks. And I, I have to echo what Julie said, you know, getting um, into the high schools, you know, I, I'm from Detroit. So when you ask about how do we make uh, Arizona the, the new, you know, the, the new car manufacturing, you know, um, in Detroit, it, it was very common with all, all the plants that you know, people got this manufacturing, manufacturing experience and they could walk right out of the high school onto an assembly line. Um, we have to get that education. We have that opportunity to drive more vocational training into the schools to start developing that workforce. Um, you know, so 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 I'm going to say that, that that's that's number one. But uh, it's it's a one B behind. Uh, I'm going to echo Renee. I ten has to happen. <laughs> we need to we need that the, that highway system because the traffic is going to increase exponentially here in the next five years. It's just not Lucid. It's just not Nicola. It's going as we as we expand. You're going to see more tier ones that want to come here as well. You know, it's just not it's just not TSMC, Intel, and, and Lucid, and and Nicola, and and Electromechanica. It's you know, it's going to be our, our tiers are going to be followed. There's going to be a lot more traffic, and we have to prepare for it. Um, and you can't start too soon because you know how transportation the, the speed of work. So it's we have to get rolling. Out. I'm thinking right now about all the manufacturing companies we know that are in the business of infrastructure and roads who are just like, I'll take your magic wand. I'll go build that road. <laughs> They're excited about that. And by the way, the folks in the chat are right there with all of you. I want to also say what an amazing conversation. Lori and Ann, you guys put this together. Thank you so, so much for doing it. This has been a fantastic conversation with a lot of great points made. A lot of important issues have been brought to the table. And it's because of the work that you all did. It's also because of our amazing panelists. So thank you, Marisa. Thank you, Renee, Britta, James, Mike, Julie, Elizabeth. You guys have been absolutely fantastic. We really appreciate everything that you've done today. This has been a great, great session. You guys really have been fantastic. You are what make it great. And you are what are making this industry great in Arizona. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you to everyone who attended, all the contributors in the chat who've also made this a meaningful conversation. 